On February 9, 2004, a 21-year-old woman disappeared after crashing her car on Route 112 near Woodsville, New Hampshire. She was last seen by two witnesses after the crash, but when the police arrived, she was no longer there. No one has seen her ever since. More than 17 years later, this case remains one of the most actively discussed, judging by the number of videos and active internet threads. But what really happened to Mora? Mora disappeared in the middle of winter when everything was covered with fresh snow and so what made things more bizarre was that her footprints were nowhere to be found. It was as though she had literally just vanished into thin air. In this video we are gonna break down everything that happened on that fateful cold winter night in one of the most bizarre disappearances ever. Plus we are gonna be covering a fresh update having to do with this case more than 17 years later after she disappeared. Mora was born on May 4, 1982 in Hanson, Massachusetts, the fourth child of Fred and Lori Murray. She had an older brother, Fred, two sisters and a younger brother, Kurt. Mora was raised in an Irish Catholic household. When she was just six years old, her parents divorced, after which Laura primarily lived with her mother. Mora graduated from the Whitman Hanson Regional High School. She was a star athlete on the school's track team. She was later accepted into the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York, where she studied chemical engineering. After her freshman year, she transferred to the University of Massachusetts Amherst to study nursing. Before her disappearance, Mora had an interesting and at times an unstable past. In November of 2003, three months before her disappearance, she admitted to using a stolen credit card to order food from several restaurants, including one in Handley, Massachusetts. It was dismissed three months later for good behavior. On the evening of February 5, 2004, four days before her disappearance, she spoke on the phone with her older sister. They discussed Kathleen's relationship problems with her boyfriend. It seemed that the conversation with her sister really affected Mora because later that evening, Mora reportedly broke down in tears. When asked what was wrong, Mora said two words my sister. On Saturday, February 7th, two days before her disappearance, Mora's father, Fred, visited her in Amherst. They went car shopping that afternoon and later went to dinner with one of Mora's friends. After dropping her father at a nearby motel, she drove to attend the party. At 3.30 a.m., while driving back to her father's hotel, she struck a guardrail on Route 9, causing $10,000 damage to her father's car. She was later driven to her father's motel and stayed there until the morning. The next day, her father rented a car, drove his daughter to the university and departed back home for Connecticut. At 11.30 p.m. that night, Fred called his daughter to remind her to obtain accident forms from the Department of Motor Vehicle. They agreed to talk again Monday night to discuss the forms and how to make the insurance claim. Little did he know, but that would be the very last time he would speak with his daughter. Let's now discuss the timeline of events leading to her disappearance. In the early morning on Monday, February 9th, Mora uses her personal computer to search for directions to Berkshires and Burlington, Vermont. At 1 p.m., she emails her boyfriend and tells him, I love you more, Stud. I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking to anyone. I promise to call you today, though. I love you, Mora. A little later, she calls a condo association in Barlett, New Hampshire, where her family vacation in the past in regards to renting a condo. Ultimately, the owner doesn't rent the condo to Mora. At 1.24 p.m., Mora emails a work supervisor of the nursing school faculty and informs her that she would be out of town for a week due to a health in her family, even though no one in her family had died. At 2.05 p.m., Mora calls a number which provides information about booking hotels in Stowe, Vermont. That call lasts five minutes. At 2.18 p.m., she phones her boyfriend and leaves him a voice message promising him that they would talk later. That call lasts just one minute. 
Between 2.30 p.m. and 3.30 p.m., she packs her car with clothing, toiletries, college textbooks, and birth control pills. Police later discover that almost everything in her dorm room had been packed and various paintings were removed from the walls. At 3.30 p.m., she sets off in her black 1996 Saturn sedan. At 3.40 p.m., Mora withdraws $280 from an ATM. CCTV footage showed that she was alone. At a nearby liquor store, she purchases $40 worth of alcoholic beverages, including Bailey's Irish cream, vodka, and a box of wine. She was alone when she made the purchases. Between 4 and 5 p.m., she leaves Amherst and heads north via I-9. At 4.37 p.m., she checks her voicemail, which was the last recorded use of her cell phone. There is no evidence that she had informed anyone of her final destination or why she was heading to where she was going. At around 7 p.m., a Woodsville, New Hampshire resident hears a loud thump outside her house. At 7.27 p.m., this person reports the accident to the Grafton County Sheriff's Department. Initially, this person claims that she had seen a man smoking inside the car, but later said that what she saw was a red light glowing probably from a cell phone. Another neighbor, watching everything from her home window, reports that someone was walking around the vehicle. She also witnesses a third neighbor pull up alongside the vehicle. Another neighbor, a school bus driver returning from work, notices the young woman was not bleeding or visibly injured, but cold and shivered. Now here's where it gets interesting. That driver of the school bus, Butch, offers to call the police, but Mora refuses, saying that she already did. But Butch knows that this area doesn't have cell phone service, so when he gets home, he phones the police from his landline phone. It's bizarre that Mora would blatantly lie like this. At 7.46 p.m., a Haverhill police officer arrives at the scene. The officer reports not seeing anyone inside or around the vehicle. Officer notices the car smashed into a tree, severely damaging the left headlight and breaking the radiator fan, making the car inoperable. The police officer looks inside the car and notices an empty beer bottle, damaged box of wine, and many more interesting things. The officer and the bus driver who had first spotted the woman drive around the area and search for her. At 8 p.m., an EMS and a fire truck arrive to clear the scene. At 8.49 p.m., her car is towed to a local garage. At 9.30 p.m., the responding officer leaves the scene. An interesting discovery was that the rag, believed part of Mora's emergency roadside kit was discovered stuffed into Saturn's muffler pipe, something we're gonna talk about a bit later. 12 p.m. the next day, Mora is declared missing almost 24 hours after the last confirmed sighting of her. The next day, Haverhill Police Department launched an investigation and began searching the area. Her father was contacted, but he did not get the message because he was working out of town at that time. On February 11th, a police dog tracked the scent from one of Mora's gloves, but then quickly lost the scent. This suggested that Mora may have left the scene in another car. Later that day, her father and boy boyfriend both arrived at Haverhill and were questioned by the police. Her boyfriend was questioned in private and then everyone was questioned together. One small detail that wasn't fully disclosed was that on a flight to Haverhill, Mora's boyfriend had turned off his cell phone. Upon landing at the airport, he received a voicemail that he believed was Mora's sobbing. The call was later traced to a calling card issued to the American Red Cross. At this point, the police believed that Mora came to the area to run away or attempt suicide Side, although her family believed this was highly unlikely. Ten days later, the FBI joined the investigation. New Hampshire Fish and Game then conducted a second ground and air search using a helicopter with thermal imaging camera tracking dogs and cadaver dogs. This search likewise did not result in any useful clues or information. Mora's sister discovered a ripped white pair of women's underwear lying in the snow on a secluded trail near French Pond Road on February 26th, but DNA tests found that the underwear did not belong to Mora. In March 2004, another young woman had disappeared just 66 miles from where Mora was last seen. The 17-year-old Brianna Maitland had disappeared on a rural road also after crashing her car into an abandoned house. This drew comparisons between these two disappearances and many people have speculated whether these disappearances were somehow connected. Later on, the police dismissed any connections between these two 
disappearances. In late 2004, a man allegedly gave Mora's father a rusty and stained knife that belonged to the man's brother, who had a criminal past and lived less than a mile from where the car was discovered. It was believed that his brother and his brother's girlfriend had acted strangely after the disappearance. In 2006, during a search of a nearby A-frame house, cadaver dogs reacted to what may have been human remains. The house had formerly been the residence of the man implicated by his brother, the one who had given the rusty knife to Mora's father. A sample from the carpet in the house was sent for analysis, but the results were never revealed to the public. In 2019, an excavation was done at the basement of that house. Mora's father, Fred, wanted to previously search the property, but the owners refused. New owners agreed to the search. Unfortunately, the excavation did not find anything useful at all. In early 2021, the tree where Mora was last seen was cut down by the property owner. At the time of this video's publication, it's been over 17 years since that fateful crash and Mora's disappearance. While the police had several clues and even various people of interest, no arrests were ever made and no real breakthroughs had ever occurred. So what really happened? How did she disappear? But before we can entertain those questions, we must answer the following. First, where was she going? Second, and most importantly, what was she looking for? Third, and probably just as important, was she traveling alone or was someone else there with her? Okay, let's break all of these questions down and attempt to get answers to all of these questions as best as we can. At this point, it's unclear what was the plan and purpose of Mora's trip to New Hampshire. The fact that she took a lot of things with her and even packed some of her stuff back at the dorm hints that she was ready to leave permanently and perhaps have someone else mail her belongings later on. What strengthens this theory even more was the fact that Mora had previously got got into an accident with her father's car and was recently disillusioned after a conversation with her older sister Kathleen. She had also problems with her boyfriend. It was alleged that he was sort of a playboy on campus and wasn't too faithful to Mora. So perhaps she was disappointed in the relationship and wanted to end it. Coupled with the fact that her parents had gotten divorced when she was fairly young may have also played a part in shaping up her life. Thus, we can make a logical assumption that her leaving was her own choice as a way to escape her life and perhaps start a new life somewhere else. But the accident was definitely not something that was planned or anticipated. Although there was alcohol brought by Mora and taken on the trip. Was she drunk when she got into an accident or did she simply fail to navigate the sharp turn on an unknown road? It was reported that one of the neighbors saw a man smoking inside the car. Later that neighbor recanted their words and now claimed that the light inside the car may have been coming from a phone. So the question stands, was Mora driving alone or was there someone else with her that night? What about the people who were the last ones to see her alive? Although she was reportedly seen last by Butch, the bus driver, and he helped in the search effort, police never really questioned him as a suspect. But where did she go after the crash? Or did someone else pick her up in a car? Here's something that we need to take into account. Looking at the map, we can see that Mora couldn't have gone in either direction unnoticed. On one side of the road was the Westwood's house, and on the other direction was Butch's house. Both had told the police that neither one had seen Mora walking past their houses after the accident. That might mean that she was picked up in another car instead of walking by foot. However, later it would become known that between the hours of 8 and 9 p.m., a local contractor noticed a young woman walking quickly on eastbound on Route 112, about four to five miles east of where Mora's crashed car was discovered. He didn't report it to the police due to his own confusion with the dates, as he only remembered this three months later. Now, whether the contractor saw Mora or not is not 100% search. But what about the bloodied knife that was sent to her father? It is also not very clear whether police questioned one of the brothers when her father received the stained knife from the other brother. Then there's the question of the house not far from where she crashed her car 
and where the cadaver dogs allegedly went crazy. Although the original owners refused the search, its new owners agreed, but nothing was found. Some people have theorized that Mora left the crash scene on her own and eventually died out in the wilderness. What strengthens this particular theory is that Mora may have been running away and interested in starting a new life, then after crashing her father's car got even more upset and decided to end her own life. Remember that piece of cloth that was found stuck in her rear muffler? Her father later told the police that it was him who told Mora to do that so that her car wouldn't stall. In September of 2021, a bone fragment was found about 25 miles north of the crash site along Route 112. According to her sister, Mora had been to the area before and had knowledge of the area. New Hampshire State Police are currently investigating and haven't ruled out whether this is tied to Mora disappearance or not. And so what really happened to Mora? Did she run away somewhere and take her own life? Was she picked up by a passing car and then something bad happened? Or does one of the neighbors know more than they're telling investigators? The one neighbor that we can no longer interview again is Butch, the bus driver. He died back in 2009. Hopefully the recent discovery opens up some clues as to exactly what happened to Mora that fateful night. But what do you think? Where do you think she was headed to? And what do you think ultimately happened to her? Let me know your theories and comments in the comment box below. Thank you so much for watching this video and if you like stories such as this one, be sure to check out the video you see appearing on the screen. You will definitely not be disappointed.